Welcome everyone to my talk about three technical solutions in Mortal Kombat Mobile. Uh, my name is Juan Gomez. I joined Sprasoft uh, in 2016. Uh, since then, I work in projects like Injustice Gods Among Us and WWE Mortals. Um, in 2020, I was the lead developer in Mortal Kombat Mobile. And since then, I actually moved to other projects and a technical director. Uh, a bit of our company. So we are a code dev studio uh, that uh, has uh, right now 11 offices in eight different countries and almost 1,000 people. Uh, here are some of the uh, clients we work for. Uh, regarding Mortal Kombat Mobile, so also known as MKM, uh, so it's a game uh, that was uh, released in 2015 for iOS and Android, and Sperasoft participated in the development of it. Uh, the game was quite uh, popular and even to this day still receiving regular updates. Um, in terms of technology, it was originally developed in Unreal Engine 3, and uh, um, uh, since then imported to Unreal Engine 4. Uh, in particular, 4.19 is the version that uh, we had the longest. But before we start, let's get to know a little bit about each other. So, uh, how many of you, actually, if you could raise your hand, know about Mortal Kombat? I guess, yeah, a lot. Uh, what about, uh, in particular, Mortal Kombat Mobile? All right, so, all right. Uh, how many of you programmers? Okay, most of you. And what about Unreal Engine? People working on Unreal Engine? All right, awesome, yeah, thanks. Uh, so, yeah, um, I hope that this overlap will be good and you will get uh, uh, something interesting from it. So basically, we will be talking about three different things. Uh, so we have um, different challenges in different areas that you know we want to stir a little bit about. And for each of them, we are going to show you the problem that we have, uh, what is the initial state that we were like, uh, like with the data, right? Uh, what tools we used to gather this data and to come up with the solutions uh, and solutions that we came up and the final state. Uh, so basically, um, there won't be like super advanced topics here, but obviously you need to know the basics to follow. Also, uh, the, the purpose of this talk is not just to tell you, okay, so we did this. Um, it's also for, you, for us to tell you like why we did it, how we did it, uh, which tools we used. So hopefully this can help you and you can take this experience to your projects. All right, so let's talk about the first uh, point, which is UI optimization. Uh, so basically, uh, UI game, like uh, mobile games, they are quite, um, um, they have a lot of user interface, a lot of menus, animations, they're heavy. Uh, we have a lot of devices that are low end. Um, and uh, for example, we were supporting uh, iPhone 6 and, and, and Android 5 devices, which are, are considerably slower than what we have nowadays. So um, if we take a look at the first example here, uh, this is uh, the collection menu. Uh, so we have uh, around 20 cards on the screen. Uh, each of those cards uh, contains like a lot of children, like 50 widgets each. And uh, so uh, there is a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, um, we can see here, a video uh, where we have the profiler. I, I don't trust you will be able to see those numbers, but <laughs> uh, I will we'll show the data later. Basically, we're lowering, we, we can see here the performance, right? So we were, uh, this is the beginning of the optimization. We are talking about uh, around uh, 20 FPS. So we have two, um, two uh, numbers we care about. So one is the idle tick and another is the scrolling tick. So the idle tick, is when nothing is moving on the screen. And that's OK, but I mean, the player doesn't care about it. Um, the player cares about the responsiveness while they are interacting with the, with the menu. So um, we need to improve it. Um, and so we begin. So the first thing we want to do uh, is talk a little bit about the tools we have. Uh, so basically, if you want to debug or like profile uh, UI in, uni in in Unreal, you want to use Start Slate, so it will show you interesting things like what's the total tick time, uh, what's the like rendering tick time, 
uh, what is the like amount of widgets you have on the screen, how many uh, draw calls you're doing, and so on. Uh, this in combination with unit graph, uh, which is kind of the same as stat FPS, right? It tells you uh, what your bottleneck is. So you can see here the blue line. Uh, so the blue line is uh, the rendering tick, and uh, you have the red line, and the red line is the game tick. Uh, so if the red line is above the blue line, that means we are CPU bound, and otherwise we are GPU bound. Uh, so what uh, uh, what we know uh, by just looking at it quickly is like our problem is CPU, uh, mostly it always is for UI. Uh, so the first thing you want to do uh, when you want to tackle like how we can improve the performance in this menu is probably looking at what already tools exist, right? So we, uh, f uh, at, at this time recently, Unreal introduced validation box. So in case you don't know what is this, uh, basically, um, it takes all the widgets that are on the on the particular element in the UI and transform it into a texture which will be later cast. So I mean, everything needs to be translated into a texture eventually, but this is saving it for future frames. So if nothing is changing here, we already have it everything prepared. Um, and uh, so using it is pretty simple. So basically, you just uh, you know put it in the hierarchy. Uh, as long as it's enabled, I mean, can cache, it will cache everything which is under it. Um, and uh, for example, we have this element under the invalidation box. Um, you can uh, mark it as is volatile, so the invalidation box will actually ignore it uh, in case you have something that is going to change every frame, but um, you, you don't want to move it outside of the hierarchy to a different place. You can keep it there if you turn it on. Um, I can. Tell a bit more about some other optimizations that are going on here already in this place. So basically, at the very bottom, uh, you can see something called energy bar slot. Uh, so that that's another thing we're doing. Basically, uh, we try to reduce as much as we can from the card um, and from all this, some other widgets, and only add it on runtime if we need it, right? Uh, which helps uh, with a lot of things. Um, and uh, yeah, the energy bar in particular, it's, it's a big, uh, um, it was giving us a lot of performance issues. I will explain it later. So why we want to use invalidation box, we can talk a little bit about how, you know, uh, Unreal processes the, the frame. Uh, so basically we have like a game thread and the game thread is gonna do, you know, the regular, update on the world, like things like physics, things like a game logic, right? And then we have the UI uh, part of the tick. And the UI is doing two things. So it's called the prepass and it's doing the on-paint. And I will explain later what this mean, actually. Uh, but for us, in terms of invalidation box, what this means is like we, we don't, uh, um, we, we will uh, save all these calculations. Next frame, we will need to, to do them again. And of course, later, this information is going to be used in the render thread. You know, we run in the stream, but we also need to draw the, the slate. And uh, yeah, the texture from the invalidation box will be used in this process. OK. Uh, so here we have a video um, of how it looks after uh, the, but uh, it's not playing. Okay. Um. Thank you. Uh, so uh, we uh, we see some in performance improvement. Um, the numbers probably you can't see, but maybe later when there will be a video, it will be a bit crispier. Um, uh, but uh, again, uh, the data is uh, is here, so we have a considerable improvement in our benchmark, and we are right now on 30 FPS. Uh, so I recommend to use um, this uh, feature if you didn't know. I'm sure in Real Engine 5 is much more stable and and um, definitely helpful. 
So uh, after we use like what uh, the engine provides, we need to start uh, looking into how we can improve our code. Uh, so I'm talking here in particular about Unreal, uh, sorry, about Visual Studio. Um, and the Visual Studio is quite simple to use for profiling if you never used it. Uh, so basically when you are debugging, you need to enable it by pressing this button. Uh, once it's enabled, you can start recording. And uh, once uh, you pause uh, the, the profiling, you can inspect the results of what you analyzed. So it looks like this. You have on the top the um, kind of call stack with time, how much uh, uh, you know we take in for a particular uh, function. And here in the code, you can navigate it. It's very helpful and convenient. And uh, it's kind of reason why I'm talking about it because Unreal has really good tools, right? It, uh, Unreal Insights and so on that you can use. But uh, Visual Studio for a programmer is it's just in some cases more convenient. And also you can actually take the experience and use this in other game engines. So um, in terms of what we want to optimize in the code, usually you want to always start with like a regular culprits. Um, so that's like the init method and the tick method, things that, you know, they run often and uh, you can really polish and, and make uh, very fast. So uh, here we have a particular problem that uh, we found. It has to do with, um, with uh, something kind of silly because uh, we were trying to access some information on init uh, from the player profile, uh, but we were saving the player profile afterwards, even though we were not changing anything. So that's something we identified with this. Obviously, changing it is, is not a it's not a problem at all. Uh, but uh, um, so it's it was super important for us from another uh, optimization that existed. So in that menu, we use recycling scrolling list. Uh, if you never heard about it, basically it's a um, you have a, a list of elements and instead of having creation and destruction runtime or having like a um, um, like all of them loaded at once you have uh, the the virtual pool that it's all the time recycling elements so one element goes out of the screen from one side so it's going and it's going to the other side is being recycled with a new data and and so on uh, so that means we are initializing our, our elements all the time as we scroll, right? And uh, yeah, uh, if you want to know a bit in a nutshell how this code will look like for the scrolling list, so basically whenever the user scrolls, uh, we, we calculate what's our new like, first line or like, uh, point of reference. Uh, we calculate how much we have moved. Uh, it's possible that we move uh, more than like one uh, line per um, Per, um, per frame if like we have very low FPS. Uh, and so we just remove it from one side, add it to the other and initialize the data. So the fix for this, uh, as you can see, um, makes that uh, this call uh, over here uh, is not even appearing as in the profiler. So it means like it's, it's fast, very fast now. Um, and uh, in the terms of uh, the result, so we can play the video, please. So we can see that we are reducing the, the spikes uh, a little bit. All right. So uh, the data that we have here uh, shows some improvement, but actually it's not a big improvement uh, because uh, this benchmark is like on PC. I did uh, for this presentation with uh, you know SSD and so on, and uh, it was a problem, a bigger problem on devices where you know you have to access like internal memory or like external memory, and uh, it was a bottleneck there. Um, but you know everything counts. So. Uh, the next thing, uh, as I mentioned before, the tick method. So we want to initialize the tick. Uh, we want to um, optimize the tick method. You just need to go there and you know find it. Okay. So here we have uh, this call. Here we have this call, right? So how can we optimize it? Like for example, we have a um, get energy method, which has to do with the energy bar I mentioned, right? So basically, we are uh, in order to calculate the energy of the particular card, we we do it. It's it's for some reason consuming, time consuming, but it doesn't need to be because 
we don't even update this so often. The energy is regenerating like super slowly. It takes like, I don't know, 10 minutes. So uh, it was even being calculated for cases where the energy was already full. So there wasn't really nothing to, to update or calculate there. Um, so yeah, it, this may be anecdotic, uh, but um, I hope you can like apply to, to your particular projects. Uh, once you fix it, so it went to, down to 0 0.14, I think 0 0.24 synchronized pro properties method. Um, and uh, here we have another video of like result of this. Okay, uh, so actually now what you want to do next, um, because you may have noticed we, we optimized our code. It wasn't really terribly unoptimized, right? Um, and we gained quite some, some profit, uh, but we still uh, not even uh, uh, close to our goals, let's say 50 FPS, or sorry, 60 FPS. Um, and uh, there are more and more things I'm not going to mention. Like, for example, we, uh, we optimize localization. So usually when you get in like a localized string, it's kind of slow. So if you can cache it, it, it saves a lot of time. Uh, you can uh, move a blueprint code to C++. This is another thing we did. So we don't have more uh, blueprint code in this particular menu. In some cases, like 10 times faster. Uh, we also... Uh, rework widgets, so the less widgets you have, the better. Uh, we had uh, some, like, uh, let's say, reduced using masks or like tricks. You can like down go, let's say, something that was previously 10, 10 widgets separated because the artist just made it like this. You can trim it to the, say, one widget only. Uh, and, uh, but anyway, um, how can we continue from here? Uh, so, uh, we actually have a tick uh, from the slate itself, right? It's very time consuming uh, and it's m much, time, much more time consuming than anything we optimize so far because we're just optimizing the small things in our code. And you can actually go and profile the engine, see what is going on. Maybe there is a problem in the engine or maybe there is not. Maybe you are using things in some wrong way or you can figure out better ways how to use your, uh, the engine uh, to do things faster. So we start going deeper, right? So we have a tick here and we see, okay, we are drawing and doing the pre-pass. So that's the things I mentioned before. So it's taking quite a lot of time. If we go deeper, uh, we see that we are calculating uh, layout size for text, which is taking a lot of time. And surprisingly, it has to do with the cache. So we have a text layout cache, uh, and we are calculating text uh, size for it. Uh, and uh, even though nothing changed, and it's supposed to be a cache. Um, so what's going on? Um, if you, we look at the um, uh, profiler here, we can see that it's showing that we are doing 384 text layout calls per frame when nothing is moving, even though we don't have so many text in the, in the game, uh, I mean on the screen at this moment. So something is definitely going wrong. And uh, we investigated what was the issue and actually found out that it has to do with scale boxes. Uh, so basically this is kind of an unreal issue uh, where you have a text uh, and this text is under a scale box, you know, in this case, so the text doesn't go out of the cart. Uh, and there is another scale box up in the hierarchy, right? Uh, they both will mess up with the cache uh, of the text. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, to, to go a bit in depth, depth with this, uh, basically when we start with the tick, we're doing first the prepass. And the prepass basically it's, it's going through all the elements in the, in the UI, in the hierarchy. It goes from the child to the parent, and later we will paint them. We paint them from parent to child. Okay, uh, but when we're doing this iteration and we're going through the children up in the hierarchy, right? We do the text and we cast, you know, we cast the size or any other things we need. Later, there is a scale box. Okay, but the scale box is affecting all the children. So now we need to do another prepass and like recalculate everything. Uh, and that's okay when there is only one, but 
if we have another um, uh, scale box in the hierarchy, now we are going to override the cache. So the cache is being overridden per frame multiple times, and uh, it's, uh, it's unique, so it basically becomes useless. Uh, our fix for this was a small, not very intrusive engine fix. So basically, instead of having like a unique cache for this, we have like a map. Um, so basically, when we do the calculations for the text, we store them in the cache. And then, uh, you know, next time we come here, if we already have it calculated, so we don't calculate again. Excuse me. Uh, and uh, yeah, if anything changes in the text, we just uh, um, we just clean the um, we clean the cache in a conservative way. Uh, so uh, here is how it looks. So it went down from 43 to 28 uh, percent of the computational time. Uh, the draw children uh, here from uh, 28 to 18, and from 11 to 6. Uh, the compute desire size went from 5.9 to 1.1, and uh, in general, uh, we have like uh, much smoother video, please. And you can maybe even notice here at the bottom, this is the uh, unit graph. It's, it doesn't have spikes that you used to have. So uh, in terms of performance, a big gain. Uh, we almost reached 60 FPS this time. Um, so that's, that's great. Uh, however, uh, we already did the recommended, use the recommended features of the engine. We already optimized our code, and we even optimized engine code. Uh, and uh, we, we want to go further. So uh, we know we're not actually bound by CPU anymore. And I already talked for quite a lot of time, so maybe someone can help me and tell me if it's not CPU or GPU, what, what can be our bottleneck now? Memory access, yes, right? Uh, so we are loading the access, uh, we are loading the images, and uh, we have, um, we are doing it synchronously, right? So we use the try load method, uh, which uh, it's good, you know, it has cache, you don't load things multiple times, it's, it's convenient, but it blocks the main thread. So we started using a, a synchronous method called load asset list. It basically, uh, more work, you need to have a placeholder for the image, uh, you need to um, have a callback uh, for the for for like when the image is loaded and replace it, but it doesn't block the main thread, and this is the key. Uh, so we have actually here a couple of old videos. These are real videos from device, not like the previous one I saw. So uh, this is before without a asynchronous loading. So if you could play the video, please. So you can see the terrible frame rate there, the spikes. It, it's only the first time you go through the collection, right? Once the cards are loaded, it's okay. So now we have um, the example, another video with, um, with a synchronous loading turn on. So if you could play it, please. All right, uh, so as you can see, uh, this is kind of like a stream case because the cards are taking a long time to load, but you know, this, the scrolling is super smooth. And uh, we have here the last video where we saw uh, in our benchmark the, the final result with all the optimizations in place. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, so you, I hope you can see the difference already. Uh, in, even though with this projector. Uh, in PC, the images load anyway instantly, just at the end you can barely see the placeholders. Um, so this is how, you, how, how it looks right now. So we made it uh, to, to 60 FPS. Uh, and um, just uh, as a quick note uh, to point out that we, we started uh, with a f uh, basically 
uh, 14 FPS as an idle tick, uh, uh, sorry, 14 milliseconds, and now we have 14 milliseconds for the scrolling tick. So this just shows how much uh, of the processing was being uh, wasted. Um, so we continue to the next part. Uh, so that was the longest, uh, and uh, I. I did it much quicker than I was expecting, so I hope we will have some time for questions. Uh, we go to the next part. Uh, it's a bit connected, but uh, you know, uh, random crashes, not really on a, a type of optimization, um, but rather, a, let's say, optimization of our crash rate, right? So our crash rate was uh, around, like our cr crash free rate, rate was around 95%, so that means that we having like a 5% uh, sessions which may uh, end up in a crash. Uh, so we want to reduce it by half at least. Um, and uh, so we are start analyzing what type of crashes we have in production. So basically, uh, some were crash of clo on close actually. So a mobile phone player will not even notice this because they just close in the game and the game crashes. Okay. Um, others are related to low-end devices. So for example, we have um, you know, lack of memory. This will be in the last part of the presentation. And then the other part about uh, bugs that cannot be reproduced by QA uh, uh, until it's too late, right? So what, uh, what does it mean? Like we can, you can say it's not deterministic, um, but basically what this means is like, uh, it cannot be reproduced yet because, you know, I mean, the computer is pretty deterministic. So, um, Let's see what, what could be the difference, right? So we start to reproduce in, you know, using the same you know, reproduction steps as, as the players, uh, but we still cannot reproduce it. Uh, we try with the same build version, and, but we still cannot reproduce it. Uh, same environment, server, uh, okay? The same device, you know, exact model, uh, the same operational system, uh, the same player safe, everything is the same. Uh, we, is the same weather, okay? Um, what can it be? What is the difference? Um, does anyone have an idea? Um, what could cause this? Applications other applications on the phone. Yes, it's a good hint. Uh, so uh, other applications in the, in the phone per se will not usually interact or affect your, your program, but they're consuming the same memory, right? Yeah, there, there are some, some such cases, but not, we're not going to discuss them here. Uh, so basically, um, um, it, it has to do with the garbage collector. So basically, uh, the garbage collector is called randomly, um, and you can call it in manually if you want uh, using this function, uh, but uh, generally, it, and it may be called more often if you know, a lot of applications are running on the phone. Uh, so how the garbage collector works in a nutshell. Uh, we have a set of U objects in, in, in Unreal, right? Uh, and we delete one of them. Uh, then the garbage collector comes and it checks every object in, in, the, in the game and it sees if you can find the reference to the root set for this object. If you cannot, like in the case of these child's of this object, they are garbage collected, okay? Um, and this one uh, object is not gonna be garbage collected because it, you can find a different uh, connection to the root set from here. And that's because of this reference that we have here. But the very important thing to understand about the garbage collector in, in, in Unreal is that this is only gonna work if this reference here is a U property. Uh, if, if this is not a U property, uh, you can say this object bye-bye because the garbage collector is gonna take it. And later you're gonna try to access it and random things gonna be there. Uh, so these are the things we were fixing. Uh, in order to, to fix them, uh, uh, fixing them is, is trivial, right? The problem is actually finding them. Uh, so for this, you want to use something like Firebase or Crashalytics or some tool that will collect data from live, from your players. Uh, what, what are they doing when their game crashed? Uh, how many times are crashing? What new crashes per version, everything, right? And most importantly, the call stack. So. If we have a call stack, we can try to fix it, right? So for example, here is an example of one bug, right? Uh, there is an, a, a um, call to some a function that ends in the crash, right? Apply talents in this case. Okay, let's go to the code. 
Uh, so here is the line. Uh, so we know that some, in order for the game to crash, something is null or it has been garbage collected, right? So you start looking at what can be. So there are some tables here that we access in. Maybe this is it. Uh, maybe this talent item server data is. Uh, you just need to go each one by one uh, analyzing uh, could that be null or garbage collected. Uh, so in this our case, it has to do with this variable over here. Uh, so basically, we are accessing the talents from the player character definition, and those were not marked as new properties. Uh, simple fix, fix. You just need to make sure, uh, like this array in particular, is marked as new property. Uh, for a similar, very similar example, another one, uh, get total health. Um, in this particular line, um, we're getting a crash. So we have a, in this uh, in this case is simpler. M character definition is being garbage collected, and we just need to add pro U property to it. Uh, I wanted to show you this other particular example because of this check that we have here. Uh, so actually, we we kind of checking like is this valid before we are accessing it, right? So. Uh, this is kind of null, null check from Unreal. It checks if something is null, but it also checks if something is going to be garbage collected. Uh, but, uh, but it doesn't check if something has been already garbage collected. So um, it won't save you in this case. And it also shows that um, uh, you, you need to like, understand, especially when you are looking at production crashes and like, uh, the call stack sometimes uh, may be uh, like not pointing you to the place. This may be something that happened fast earlier, and it may be uh, because of, um, of things like uh, the you know code has been optimized by compiler, right? So the lines no longer match. Um, so yeah, we just add the property in this particular case. Uh, it's a structure in the class. Okay, another one. Uh, this time related to lambdas. So basically, we have um, the uh, two events, right? On player profile ready, uh, and we have on player profile login finished. And for these two events, we are subscribing a lambda. Uh, and uh, what we found out is that uh, some of these elements that we expected to have to be there, uh, they've been garbage collected. In particular, this uh, uh, this handle uh, that is uh, we we were accessing, and. Uh, uh, the solution at the time uh, it was something like we just you know uh, we don't use the lambdas in this particular case uh, we we just use uh, um, you know regular uh, methods and uh, this this solved the problem but actually I was investigating what happened here and why was this happening and I found two things uh, one is that Unreal has now a new uh, way to add lambdas into the into the event. Uh, instead of add lambda is add weak, weak lambda and uh, it, it takes into consideration that something may be garbage collected and uh, you know checks before calling something so you, you at least don't get a crash. Um, I also found that uh, this bug in particular is w I was not able to reproduce it in last Unreal Engine version. So it could have been at the time like a real engine bug where we like garbage collector was not taking this into consideration properly because the events are, are not your properties and actually you can't mark them as your properties. So the garbage collector needs to consider it like in a different way. Okay, so the final state that we reach a crash free rate of 98%. Uh, we reduce crash uh, per user around 50%, which is a little bit different metric because you know, more, uh, some players may have more crashes by average than others. We also reduce app not responding um, events by 90%, uh, which was uh, great, but not really um, discussed here right now, very in important metric. Uh, and what we have left actually to continue working, uh, mostly related to SDKs and real engine, uh, you know, they have bugs and that's why you want to you know, keep them up to date if possible. Uh, it's something that we had trouble with because we basically, um, like, when you start modifying the engine, it's, it becomes harder and harder to update. And uh, yeah, obviously bugs that were introduced by us in the latest update, uh, which we um, 
uh, always need to you know continue fixing uh, and that's why it's important that you have such a reporting tool that will tell you that you introduce a new bug all right uh, so we're going to the last part of the presentation so this is about ROM, ROM optimization uh, it has to do with the first and the second part because the you know we, it's an optimization and, and it's solving the problem that you will, if you run out of memory the game is going to be closed by by the operational system. So uh, what did we do? Uh, we start by looking in particular to our um, device with lowest RAM, which is iPhone six uh, with one gigabyte and our uh, most memory intensive mode, uh, which is the combat. Uh, so here we have um, six characters at once. Um, I mean, not on the screen at once, but they are in the memory. Uh, we have uh, the arena where they are fighting. Uh, we have all the our textures, the 3D models, or the VFXs. We have sounds and we have UI. And of course, the game. Uh, so if we look at the uh, rundown of, of one of our worst cases. Uh, so this is how it looks like. Most of the, the memory is used by engine. It's, it's grouping here um, also game, our game code and everything. I, I'm more interested right now in like the part above. So these are the meshes, the BFXs, animation sounds and textures that we can do something about uh, relatively easily. Uh, so basically, if in order to do this, uh, you need something like a stat memory. Uh, so this is the easiest command you can run on your on your game to profile what the memory is being used for. So basically, we have a texture. Uh, how much memory is used for textures or UI textures or character textures and so on? But actually, I prefer uh, other commands like stat LLM, so low level memory. Uh, it shows a bit more uh, interesting grouping of information, so it's uh, divided by engine, textures, animations, and so on. Uh, and, uh, and still, it's not enough in, in most of the cases. You want something like memreport. Uh, so this is uh, creating a huge file. It tells you there everything, uh, all the bytes, where they are going, right? Uh, starting from the code, how many instances of the classes you have, uh, textures that you have, sounds, uh, uh, animations, everything is going to be here. So we start looking at what, uh, what we can trim. So in terms of uh, art and you know, things like 3D models, actually, they are already quite optimized. So there is not much we can do there, because we taking the models from a uh, console version, uh, MK11, let's say, we are uh, making low polys of them. It, they have around 5 to 10k polygons, maybe 15 for the like MK11 characters. Uh, and uh, there is a quite a really, uh, you know, modest uh, budget for, for textures. Obviously, you need to add uh, props to it, uh, like weapons and things like this that characters are using. But you, we have around 5 to 10 megabytes per character, right? Uh, arenas were also optimized previously. Uh, we use static meshes. That's not a RAM optimization, rather CPU optimization, but you know something to consider. The elements are reused, so you, if you can, you know, the same item is placed in different places in the in the scene. But in general, uh, 40 to 60 megabytes. Um, I think it could be optimized more, but it's an artist job. Um, in terms of BFX. Uh, they were one of the first things we work on to optimize because um, they affect uh, CPU, uh, uh, GPU, memory, everything. So uh, we have a limit on the textures, although some textures may be bigger. Uh, we have a different uh, LODs uh, for low-end devices. Uh, obviously, the textures, uh, the, the BFXs are pulled. Um, and uh, they and we also I also mentioned here that we use minimal overdraw, so we noticed that um, in particular, like low-end graphic cards having transparent textures of, on top of each other was uh, giving a lot of uh, cost. Uh, so we we had a tool to spot these these cases and and like rework the BFXs. Uh, but in general, we are sitting around 10 megabytes per character for, in terms of BFXs mostly blood. Uh, so for the animations, we have a, uh, we actually have something that we can work on. So the animations are using a lot of space. Uh, and uh, that's kind of expected, because we have 
uh, four different uh, skeleton types. Uh, so like f male, female, like uh, guys with four arms and so on. Uh, and uh, each of them, they have like specific bones. So for example, uh, things like for cloth and like for the hair, because we're not uh, physically simulating those at runtime. Uh, and uh, we also have a lot of reaction animations. So when one character attacks the other and they, um, they need to perform some synchronized move. Um, so um, it's up to 30 megabytes per character. And these are some of the things we did to optimize it. So basically we limited the FPS for the animations. 30 FPS is enough in most of the cases. Uh, we remove unneeded bones from those animations that we um, uh, that uh, they didn't need it because a particular character uh, only particular character is going to execute this animation and they don't have those bones. Uh, also, we applied compression, the one from Unreal Engine. So, in particular, we're removing every second frame. Uh, and that has some problems in some corner cases, some uh, artifacts sometimes, but you can always disable it. Uh, and uh, we go down to 5 to 10 megabytes per, per, the, per the character. Uh, so this is mostly an artist's job and actually it took a lot of time, uh, but they needed us to figure out what was the problem. Um, so we reduced the animations and this is how it looks right now. Uh, the next thing we're looking at is sounds. Uh, sounds are also uh, used in out of space, and what's worse, they were not standardized. Uh, they were basically imported as they come from the from the console version. Um, the newer sounds were very high definition, uh, and uh, to be honest, uh, we we don't need such a definition. A lot of players they play without the sound or without the headphones. The the phone doesn't have such a speakers, right? Uh, so the optimizations obviously come from compressing them, uh, using the Unreal compression uh, around 40% to prove the best you know, compromise. Uh, and we also established the process so they, uh, could, they could have uh, separate uh, settings based on the type. Uh, so uh, for most of the general sounds, we just have uh, one uh, channel. Uh, for the music, we want to have uh, stereo. So two channels, uh, and then for some uh, key sounds, we can have like higher sample rate, uh, you know, like school crashing uh, sounds. Uh, and uh, this was actually quite simple and mostly automated. Um, it's a very easy thing to skip because no one knows about sounds. They don't, no one knows how to get the best out of them, uh, but actually super easy. And so, we almost down to one gigabyte. So what can we do next? Uh, let's look at the report we had from before, right? And we, uh, uh, we, we can look at textures, right? So here we have all the textures that we uh, using. So we, 2K texture is using four megabytes and 1K texture is using one, one megabyte. And uh, you can find funny things. Like for example, here we have a main menu texture atlas. Uh, that we are loaded in combat, uh, but that probably it's a mistake, right? So let's see what's going on. Uh, so uh, we have UI text uh, uh, sprites, right? And those sprites are grouped in atlases. Uh, they look something like this. So basically we have, uh, these are for the cards and we have uh, the frames and some icons, right? And we are always reusing it, or let's say artists always reuse it. So basically, uh, these small icons that we have here, uh, they, are, uh, they were part of the menus, and at some point they were used for the combat UI. Uh, and now suddenly we are loading the whole texture, right, in, uh, for, for the, just these small icons. Uh, so some optimizations uh, that you may need to do if you start looking into what's going on with these textures, basically, uh, you may need to fix memory leaks because uh, basically, there is a chance that this texture, maybe you didn't need it at all, right? But it is just there uh, for some reference. Uh, you will need to rework the code probably, uh, split atlases, uh, or maybe duplicate uh, information from one atlas to another even. It's better to uh, load only the atlases you need rather than have less atlases, right? Uh, so just watch out, uh, atlases can backfire if you don't use them like uh, with a bit of uh, thought on, on what uh, they're going to be done for. Uh, 
Okay, uh, so we managed to get under one uh, gigabyte uh, for the iPhone 6. Uh, this is uh, just temporary, right? Every time new things are added to the game, uh, this will uh, go and uh, uh, it's, it will be increasing again. Something that we could do next, actually, is uh, investigate what's going on with the engine. Why is it using so much memory, right? Um, I did take a look and actually, like the, the, in terms of our game code, right, um, we don't have a lot of algorithmic uh, calculations that will take memory. We don't have like pathfinding. Uh, our AI is quite simple and it doesn't use memory. So uh, probably something for another talk. Um, and in general, uh, that's everything. Uh, so uh, we have, I think, 10 minutes for questions. Uh, just a reminder that you can apply if you want to Sparasoft. And here are some links. Thank you. So, anyone wants to ask something? So maybe uh, the question about the, 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 the recent um, uh, example, you have shown the atlases, and I wonder, did you try to uh, explore idea of uh, optimizing atlases themselves because it seemed those cards had a lot of empty space inside mm -hmm. they are wasting a lot of memory mm -hmm. you can slice them right mm -hmm. like in a nine patch way did you try this or yeah. uh, did you um, have a, like good uh, enough solution with uh, just you optimizing the mm -hmm. other side yeah so uh, i think nine slice is something that uh, probably uh, unreal provides uh, so if we go back here uh, you may notice that actually uh, there are, uh, like the way artists did them, they they not uh, really tileable. Uh, they could be, I agree. Um, it's something that, uh, um, that uh, it's, it's just a kind of coaching process for artists, explain them like, hey, you can do this and this is how you do it, right? And this is how it's going to look good. We can do tools for you. Uh, but... Um, for many many cases they will just uh, first they will do it like this right uh, so um, in, a, in either in either way you will need to later come and you know uh, in optimize it either by nine slicing it or by dividing it into different uh, atlases so yeah not, definitely um, good optimization so yeah thanks for pointing all right more questions over there Hi, thank you for your talk. Uh, Profilers user usually takes some CPU load, and uh, what the percentage uh, difference of CPU load on mobile uh, you faced mm -hmm. was uh, compared to shipping build? Okay, so um, yeah, I, I didn't mention that um, uh, in terms of slightly late profile. So the data you see on the screen, obviously, it's altered, it's, uh, it's adulterated because it's a lot of time is used to actually process that uh, that information. Uh, there is a way you can call Unreal Engine and get that uh, profiler data into the file uh, without uh, you know such overhead. Uh, so you can use that. Uh, in terms of uh, what is the difference between uh, our final builds, uh, so we we obviously always check against the final builds. So in terms of optimization, uh, so either we check in or like QA is checking, right? So um, I can tell you how much. I don't think it is too much. I think it's like maybe five, ten percent, something like this. It's not huge. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Anymore? So, hi. I have a question also about, so you were talking about some engine bugs that you were, mm -hmm. had. 
does it still a case with like newer version of Unreal Engine or mm -hmm. especially like this scaling? Thing okay, for so your so um, um, s since then uh, we have um, we are using the latest Unreal Engine four version um, and that's definitely helping. But it's it's always the problem in the sense that. Uh, there is no more Unreal Engine 4 versions, right? So if you want to keep up to date now, you need to go to Unreal Engine 5. It's very time consuming. Uh, and uh, once you do it, uh, you may solve some problems. Uh, another thing our team usually doing is just simply going to the, to the repo of uh, Unreal Engine and trying to find that, that fix and we merge it manually. Um, so yeah, in this particular case, it's something that we did, but sometimes the, the fixes, they already exist and you can find them in, in repository. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I have <coughs> a similar question you said about uh, updating SDKs and stuff because mm -hmm. uh, like engine have bugs. So updating SDKs is obviously quite easy. Mm -hmm. But uh, in case like that, that you find a bug, do you always need to go like through um, upstream, check it, and then merge it back? It's probably a lot of work. Do you mm -hmm. or do you consider like updating engine? in the process or is it too risky? It's so you need always to find a specific solution, cherry pick it on your uh, code and... Yeah, so uh, this is kind of like a, a so vicious cycle, cycle, right? Because the more you uh, cherry pick, the harder it becomes to actually later update because you have uh, your started accumulated modifications, right? So uh, you, you're trapped uh, at some point and it just becomes impossible really to, to update the engine. And not only that is that the fact that now you are like, let's say five or six versions behind and there is a feature you're using that is no longer supported or something like this. And you need to rework, I don't know, the way we do in the animation sequences, for example, or things like this. So we, you kind of blocked, you can't update the engine easily. And uh, you, it's not like you want to, like you don't want to update it. It's like you can't really at some point with a reasonable amount of time. Um, but yeah, we did it in the end because obviously it's, it's the right thing. Um, it's uh, the difference between like a short term gain in terms of like how much time you need to, to fix something versus like how much you need to fix it like later, right? All the uh, legacy like debt that you're accumulating. So, um, so yeah, I mean, uh, updating from Unreal Engine 4 uh, to the latest version was challenging, but not so challenging, for example, as updating from Unreal Engine 3 to Unreal Engine 4. Uh, so it's just the cost that keeps coming back, right? Mm -hmm. So if, if I have to, if I can say it's like, um, you should always try to uh, update, and that's it. Like you, it's not worth it in the long term to be behind. Uh, you just spending, uh, much more time just to keep your engine, let's say, parallel version of the engine up to date uh, than you will spe spend by actually performing the update, but you just don't have time for it, like in short uh, time frames. Like we were publishing updates like every few months, right? So you don't have like a long period of time where you can say, okay, now we are doing this thing. So, yeah. Yeah, thank you. We have some time still. Two minutes, yeah, and one or two more questions, yeah. Well, if you need anything, I will be in Spares of Booth. Uh, come and see us, and we can talk more. Yeah, thank you very much, everyone.